Hello, my name is Moran Hilgendorf. I'm with the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program. We're here at the, at the Moat Marine Laboratory, Charlotte Harbor Field Station in Pine Island. We'll now go to maps to show you where we are. This is the southern half of Florida. This area here is the Tampa, Tampa Bay area. This is Lake Okeechobee. This is the Miami area. And we're here on Pine Island. Let's now look at, take a look at the estuary. Pine Island Sound is one of many estuaries in southwest Florida with its own distinct personality. This estuary is located between an island and the barrier islands of Cayo Costa, Captiva, and Sanibel. The islands you see are mangrove islands. We're at high tide now, but during low tide, much of the area you see are feeding grounds for herons, egrets, and other wading birds. You'll learn a great deal during this hour, and if we don't have time to answer your questions during the live broadcast, we'll answer them after. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to our live on-site audience. There are fifth, sixth grade teachers, uh, I'm sorry, sixth grade students from Lee Middle School in Fort Myers, Florida. Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program is the host of this, this program. I'd like to introduce you now to Dr. Lisa Beaver, the director of the program, who will explain this partnership. Welcome to beautiful Pine Island Sound. I'm Dr. Lisa Beaver, and I'm director of the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program. We are a partnership of local, state, and federal agencies, citizens, and scientists working to protect fish and wildlife habitat, water quality, and hydrology. We do this through research, restoration, legislation, and education. Thank you, Lisa. Estuaries are very important. They're very productive environments. And now to tell you a little bit more about how Southwest Florida estuaries are different is Jim Clark, Chief Meteorologist with NBC2 here in Fort Myers, Florida. Hello, Jim. Thank you. Good morning. And it is a good morning here in Southwest Florida. We are looking at a really nice day. It's getting a little warm and we should see a high of around 90. As was pointed out before, we are in an estuary, and over there, the islands, as the kids walk by, the islands over there, uh, beyond that is the Gulf of Mexico, and beyond that, about 1,000 miles, is Texas. That's the Gulf of Mexico is very salt water, uh, while uh, to the other side over here is the mainland of Florida, which gets a lot of rain during the summer months, and that rain is fresh water that then flows into the same area. So this is where the salt water of the Gulf of Mexico meets the fresh water that flows off the Florida Peninsula. Now, the thing that's interesting about South Florida estuaries is that we don't have the same type of weather as much of the rest of the United States. Further to the north, you have four seasons. You have spring, summer, winter, and fall. But down here, people say we only have two seasons, the wet season and the dry season. And the reason for that is because we get about 80% of our rain during the six months from May to this month, October. And only about a little over 20% of our rain falls during the winter months from November to April. And so when the rain falls in the winter months, most of that just soaks into the ground. There's very little freshwater runoff into this body of water during the winter months. So it gets a bit more salty than many estuaries around the rest of the United States. But during the uh, summer months, when we get all of the thunderstorms and the heavy downpours, we start to see a lot more of the freshwater runoff come into this bay and it gets uh, less salty and a little bit more fresh. Also, occasionally here in southwest Florida, we have to deal with hurricanes. Now, we've been in a lull, and it's been 42 years since a hurricane has directly impacted this estuary. Since then, we've had tropical storms, and they have an impact, but not as big as a full-fledged hurricane. The history of this area, though, has lots of hurricanes. Uh, before 1960, back into the 1800s, fully 18 hurricanes have come within about 50 miles of this location. So uh, the estuary is adapted to uh, fewer hurricanes now, but in the future, it may have to deal with more, and nature will likely adapt to that increased cycle of hurricanes. We also have kind of two temperature regimes. During the rainy months, it's hot. We have uh, highs generally up around 90 degrees and morning lows in the 70s. And right now, I don't have my thermometer, but it's in the 80s, I'm pretty sure, getting kind of sticky out here. Where in the summer or in the winter months, the highs are generally in the 70s, maybe to near 80 degrees, and the lows are down in the 50s. And that is why so many people are moving to southwest Florida is for those six months out of the year when the weather is what we would call ideal with less rain and uh, nearly perfect temperatures. So we also are seeing the problem now developing with so many people living here uh, interacting with the nature of the estuary, we have to try and find a balance to, so that both can uh, coexist without damaging each other. Or certainly, I don't think the estuary is going to damage any humans, but as humans, we don't want to uh, endanger the estuary. And there's a lot of programs uh, uh, 
involved to try to keep the estuary healthy. And so far, it's not doing too badly. I think we're, we're actually making uh, some headway, although more people keep moving and it's a difficult task. Still a great place to live, great weather here in southwest Florida, and as you can see, a lot of really beautiful scenery as well. Thank you, Jim. And you may have noticed that while Jim was talking, we had Mullen jumping in the background. And we'll probably see a, a few more of those while, we, uh, while you spend the hour with us. Well, we have warm weather, rain, and importance uh, in common with estuaries of the past. And here's Dr. Professor Corbett Torrance with Florida Gulf Coast University and Fort Myers Beach Moundhouse to tell us a little bit about how estuaries were important to the early Americans. Welcome, Corbett. Good afternoon. Good morning, actually. Um, you know, when you think what we had for breakfast and stuff, and we may have had some cereal, maybe we had a little bit of bacon, and all these things we got at a supermarket. We get a cart, and we hunt up and down the aisles, and we gather things into our cart, and we bring them home. But all that stuff, at one point, came from the environment. For the Calusa, the estuary was their supermarket. Uh, they got most of their food from the estuary. In fact, this material that you see down here has been excavated from a Calusa Indian site. And if you look carefully, in between the shells, you see lots of shells, but there are also lots of fish bones in here. Uh, this is a uh, shark here. Uh, this is jack. These are mullet vertebrae, and actually you heard the mullet uh, jumping in the background. This is a mullet here, and actually mullet, mm, it's really good. This is a uh, sea trout, and then we have catfish, and this little guy here, this is the right maxilla of a sheep's head. And we have a stingray barb, and then here's a little blue crab. Over here, this is a thread herring. In fact, the Clusa ate a lot of thread herring. And this is a little thread herring steak. See this would be this part here, right there? You can see the little vertebrae there. And thread herring, mmm, it's really good. Mmm. We also have, in fact, they ate over 40 different types of fish that they got from the estuary. Uh, in fact, almost all the fish that live in the ocean spend at least part of their lives in the estuary. It's the nursery for the fish. And for the Calusa, it was a source of their food. They also ate shellfish. We have a tulip, a fighting conch, a pear whelk, a lightning whelk, and a king's crown. You'll see a lot of these right over the wall here and also clams, and they, they ate the shellfish, but they also used the shellfish to make their tools. This is a Calusa hammer, and we could take our Calusa hammer, we take one of these clams here, and pop it open like that, and I'll tell you, these clams, you don't even have to cook them. They're really good. They also, because there's no metamorphic rock in Florida, these shells were the hardest material they had. So this is an ax. See the beveled edge there? This is a piece of an ax. Not only did they use the shells to make their tools, but they also used the shells to build their mounds. So the estuary provided the Calusa with food, tool material, and material to build their mounds. And we can take a look over the edge here, and you can see all this food swimming around right behind us. There's a king's crown eating a clam. These are little chubs in there. Some of the larger fish we see in there are thread herring. That's all food. This is the Calusa supermarket, the estuary. Well, thank you, Corbett. Well, now we're going to explore the estuary a little bit more. And here to tell us about Florida's walking trees is Abby Banks, an intern with the Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center. Hello, Abby. Good morning. Hi. Mangroves are trees found in warm climates near salty water. Mangroves are valuable because they filter the pollution out of the water. They prevent erosion by anchoring soil with their roots. Many birds find shelter in their branches. Falling leaves that are decayed of mangroves are important food for many animals. Animals that are found in mangroves can include the alligator, many birds such as the owl, eagle, <laughs> brown pelican, and many more. Shrimp, crabs, oysters, spiders, dragonflies, and butterflies are also found in mangroves, along with many other types of animals. Students, will you please present the animals of the mangrove forest that benefit greatly from the, the three types of Florida mangrove trees? 
They are the red, black, white mangroves. Each tree species has different characteristics about them. The red mangrove is found to the closest of the is found closest to the water and is probably the best known. The red mangrove is easily identified by the tangling anchoring roots called prop roots. The growth of these roots has earned red mangrove the name walking trees because they creep into new areas by its branching roots. The red mangrove is also known as the mother tree. She drops her seedlings, also known as propagules, which develop during the summer months and after dropping can develop roots in four to six hours, making the red mangrove the mother tree that gives live birth. The red mangrove has leaves that are shiny, dark olive green, but the underside is a lighter green, usually with small dark spots. The black mangrove is identified by the presence of numerous finger-like projections which can be found right over there and you can see as the projections are entering out of the sediment of the root system. The black mangrove leaves are dull, dark green on the top, but the but the underside is a distinctly lighter silver green color without dark spots. The leaves are often coated with salt crystals, especially during the dry periods, which Florida receives many times. Unlike the red or black counterparts, the white mangrove usually has no visible aerial root systems. The easiest way to identify the white mangroves is by its leaves. As you can see, they are a lot more oval than the other two species. They are uniform pale green on both sides. But the way that you can most likely tell these two, this white mangrove from the other two species is by the two, <laughs> by the two nodules on the side of the stem. These are known as sugar glands. Worldwide, as many as 50 or more species of mangroves exist. Today, we have discussed the three species found in Florida. They are red, white, and black mangroves. Mangroves are Florida's true natives and are part of the Florida's history and heritage. Well, thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce you to Kate Nedza with the Marine Science Program, who will be... Kate, would you join me, please? Who has brought some of the students from the Marine Science Program here, and you can see some in the background. We well, they were in the background. They were out <laughs> here. They've been collecting things all during the course of the morning, and... Um, we're going to be talking to some of the students and having them tell us and show us some of the things that we have found. Okay. Okay. Before we get to you, though, we'd like to talk with Dr. J John Taylor of Grand Tours. Thank you. <laughs> He'll tell us about Florida's underwater meadows, seagrasses. Hi, everybody. My name's Jack Taylor. Let's talk about seagrasses. Seagrasses are perhaps the most important and conspicuous plants in Florida's estuaries. They're conspicuous because they normally grow in clear, clean, shallow water, and they're extremely important because they are prodigious producers of very nutritious feed in the form of leaves. Regrettably, seagrasses have been destroyed to an alarming degree in Florida. For example, in 1950, when our population was about 2.6 million people, there were 5 million acres of seagrasses. Currently, in the year 2002, there are 16 million people in Florida and only 2 million acres of seagrasses. This is a reduction of 3 million acres of seagrasses in as little as 52 years, or about a 60% reduction in Florida's total seagrass resource. Currently, seagrasses do not get the degree of protection they warrant. And if our rate of seagrass destruction continues, I'm sure we'll soon have more golf course communities than we have seagrass communities in Florida. Right now, I'd like to talk about the food production in seagrasses. And I've brought a piece of turtle grass, which is the most common and widespread seagrass in Charlotte Harbor to demonstrate what I want to talk about. 
The seagrasses produce food in these long, beautiful green leaves. And animals like the manatee and the green sea turtle, for which this grass is named, turtle grass, eat the leaves of turtle grass directly from the plant. These leaves last, each one lasts for about two or three months, and then is discarded by the plant, and then floats around in the estuary, comes ashore, falls on the bottom, begins to decompose, and looks like this. Some animals eat seagrass in this condition. And finally, during the last stages of decomposition, seagrass is reduced to a form that we call organic detritus. And surprisingly as it may seem, this is the form in which most fishes and invertebrates that live in our estuaries consume seagrass. At this point, the organic detritus particles are coated with a lot of bacteria and fungi, which are, of course, involved in the process of decomposition. And believe it or not, this increases the food, con of each, food content of each particle by about 20%. Other functions of the seagrass include a place for animals to hide among all these leaves, a place for animals to attach themselves, and you can see some little worm tubes on this leaf. The seagrass leaves make cover for fishes to spawn in. The roots and rhizomes, this is the rhizome, also make a dense mat on the bottom where animals can live. So I think it's incumbent upon us all to do all we can to conserve and protect seagrasses and in behalf of seagrasses everywhere, I, uh, I thank you for your interest and uh, your understanding, your consideration, and hopefully your help in the conservation of seagrasses. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Taylor. We're now going to see what kind of creatures live in the estuaries. And we have Kate Nedza and his students again, who will show some of the things that they were collecting earlier this morning. As you can see, our background is the Charlotte Harbor. A few moments ago, our crew went into Charlotte Harbor and they collected some pretty neat creatures. I'm talking about some egg mass that we found. When this matures, we, there is no deter we ha cannot determine what this is going to be, but it might be over a thousand different marine organisms. It's very slimy and runny. As I tip my hand, you can see it run. And we like I said, we cannot determine what this is. Dana, what do you have? Here I have what is called a crown conch. This is called a crown conch. This is the body of the animal. And whenever I move my finger, it will try and to contract itself into its shell and it can go completely in and cover itself with this hard mass, which is called the foot. The foot is also used to arm the animal from any animals that try to eat it or harm it in any way. It gets its name from the points at the top of the shell which resemble a crown. As you can see here it has a various coloration but yet on the other side it is covered with algae. It is cleaner on this side than the other side because when the animal comes out it will clean the shell. The shell is called a univalve meaning that it is one shell in a continuous shape. Unlike this, which is a bivalve, meaning you can split it apart and it is two. If this organism were to die or be killed, it would, the shell will be completely empty. And if we put it back in the harbor, there is a chance that there might be another animal that will come and move into it as the hermit crab. What do you have, Heather? I have what we call a mango tree crab. Um, this is about a full size. Maybe it'll get a little bigger. It's not the ones we eat like the blue crab or a snow crab. Um, this one thing unique about it is that it does climb actually in the mango trees. Um, when the trees start to shed their leaves, as we heard earlier, we, um, they start to decay and then that actually provides food for the other organisms. What fish do you have, Mr. Nesta? Well, over here we've got a, a fish that's often used as a bait fish and uh, he's trying to get away from me right now. You know, these fish are kind of fast. And so, there we go, we've got the fish, we've got a 
a horseshoe crab, we got a conch, but the one we're talking about is this big regular looking fish right there. It's known as a pinfish, and you notice that he doesn't like being caught like this because lots of times when that happens, he ends up on the end of a hook and is becoming uh, food for some other fish. Now, one of our other teachers in the marine science program is Claire, and uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about how the Peace River affects the estuary. We live in Hardy County and the Peace River flows through Hardy County and what's interesting is that people even 130 miles away from the estuary system can totally affect this estuary system. So it's important to be mindful of the rivers and things around you in order to keep this estuary system clean. Well thank you all. We're now going to walk over to the Moat Marine Laboratory's mobile exhibit. We are lucky enough to have them here with us today. Caton and his crew were able to collect specimens from the, the shallow waters and these are specimens that might be found in a little bit deeper water. We're about halfway to the mobile exhibit, so can you tell us a few more things, Caton? Yes, one thing we're very fortunate about here in southwest Florida is to have so many good estuary uh, programs and things, like Moat Marine Aquarium is down here, and uh, we have a lot of opportunities with Rookery Bay that we'll talk about later. And one of the most fascinating things about conducting a marine science program is like this summer, we were able to have our students actually release a little baby sea turtle into the Gulf of Mexico so it could start its life. Okay, uh, Moran, can you tell us about the moat? Are we going to the students now? Can they tell us a little bit more? Okay, here I have what is called a common, common spider crab. It has small claws at the tips, and it has a beak nose, which it has a V-shaped notch. Um, this animal resembles maybe a spider, but it is a crab. Lacey, what do you have? I have a variegated sea urchin, and as you can see, it has a reddish and purplish color to it. It is very spiny and round. You can find these in mangrove trees and in turtle flats. They range between North Carolina, Florida, the Bahamas, and West Indies. Usually these unique creatures are camouflaged with bits of shells and plant debris and um, plant material. Heather, what do you have? I have what we call an Atlantic horseshoe crab. One unique thing about this is they've been around for two million years. Scientists have discovered that the blood or fluid of the inside of this animal can help to pure, help the purity of a medicine. They are found in muddy or sandy bottoms and range along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Well, we've seen that there's some amazing and beautiful creatures that live here. And what we're going to do now is take a, a close-up look of oysters, but while we're walking back to the other station, Kate's going to tell us a little bit more about some of the shallow things that we could find in estuaries. Out in, the est out in the estuary system, there's tons of different things. One of them that we didn't have to show today was a blue crab. Now, earlier you heard about how the uh, early Indians, the Calusa Indians around here, relied on the estuary as their food supply. Today, we still have that. We have many people that derive their living by catching blue crabs, by taking fishing charters out and things so that uh, the estuary today is just as important as it was many years ago. Over here right now we are with uh, NOAA sponsored Rookery Bay Estuarine Reserve. We've yes. been down there many times and they do a great job. Thank you, Caton. I'd like to introduce, I just drew a blank on your name, Vicki McGee from Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Re Reserve which, who will tell us a, a little bit more about oysters. Thank you. Um, this is the American Eastern Oyster. It's the most common oyster that we have. It's found all up and down the eastern seaboard around Florida, in the Gulf of Mexico, and all the way over to Texas and the Bahamas. Um, they're mainly fr found in the estuarine environment where the freshwater and saltwater meet, and especially at the mouths of rivers. And there's a couple reasons for that. The, um, they're filter feeders, so they filter out organic particles and single cell algae to eat, and the rivers can provide that. They also, the freshwater environment, um, relieves them of some of the predation. Um, their oysters are very prolific, which means they produce a lot of young. Uh, one of the things in this area, they reproduce in the um, late spring, summer, and early fall, which is our warmer months and also coincides with the um, hurricane season and our rainy season. So that helps feed the oysters, and in some cases, there'll even be large spawning events following a hurricane. Um, the, a single oyster can produce up to 10, between 10 million and 20 million eggs, and a large oyster will produce around 100 million. Some of the larger um, oysters will even spawn several times during the year, and um, 
interestingly, they can change sex throughout the season. So one spawning event, they may be female producing eggs, and another, they will be male. Generally, the larger oysters are functional females producing only eggs. Um, one of the things that I like about oysters is not only do they provide food for people and other animals, they're also what I call living condos. So as you can see within the oysters themselves, there's some mussels nestled in there and they attach through bissel threads at the end. And if we pop a few of these open, if I can do it, you might see some crabs. See these little small mud crabs? I've got one out here that's a little bit larger. Um, when all the oysters are clumped together like this, they form what is called a, an oyster bar. And during the time after they spawn, the larvae are planktonic, which means they float within the water column until they find a suitable substrate in which they attach. They can do this by forming a type of glue, which allows them to, to attach to this hard substrate. And then at that point, they start producing um, the shell, and that's sometimes known as spat. Um, people will collect the spat on tiles and use that to reseed bars or cause bars to become bigger and bring in more, more oysters. Um, like I said, the, during low tide, the oyster bar is exposed, and they, the animals, the organisms like the crabs, and there's even some polychaete worms, which are predatory worm that live within here, will uh, hide within little spaces, especially like the dead oysters. Where you can see how that pops open, that makes a nice little hiding spot, it'll fill with water, and then at low tide, the crab will stay inside the oyster and will be able to still have his gills wet and live. So there's a lot of things that live within the oysters um, throughout the tidal cycle. Uh, when the tide comes in, then you have fish and um, other organisms that come and feed on the different organisms that live within the oysters themselves and on the oysters. So you'll see toadfish and things like that. Um, birds are also important part of the oyster bar. They like to um, go on the low tide and pick out some of these organisms. The main thing is it's really important that we have good water quality because oysters are filter feeders. We eat the oysters and in turn whatever they eat we end up eating. So um, you guys have any questions? Okay. Well thank, thank you, you Vicki. All right. Well, now we're moving over to another area so we can learn a little bit more about the larger creatures that live in our estuaries. Here we have Xander Schrode, who is a student at, at School in the Park in Sarasota. Welcome, Xander. Or are you Turtle Boy? <laughs> Hi, I'm Xander Schrode, and I would like to educate you about sea turtles. There's three different types of turtles in the estuaries, one marine turtle and two sea turtles. When a turtle comes off the beach, they'll go back to the same beach to lay eggs. When a turtle hatches, they come off the beach, they'll go onto the beach and see many predators, such as birds, dogs, um, raccoons, armadillos, and crabs. Did you know that only one turtle out of 2,500 will make it to maturity? When the turtles go off the beach, they'll go into the sargasm weed line, which is some weeds offshore that they can stay there and, until they're about the size of a dinner plate. When they're the size of about a dinner plate, they'll go into the estuaries. The, the most d endangered turtle there is, is the Kim's Ridley. We have them right out here in the Charlotte Harbor Bay. Another turtle in the estuaries is a green turtle. They feed on the, the turtle grasses and the seaweed. The, um, the diamondback terrapin is another turtle. They get to nine inches long and they'll eat the crabs and the gastropods in the estuary. They get to four, they'll, they'll live 40 years old and they will never go into the salt water. They'll always stay in the brackish waters of the estuaries. Does anybody have any questions? Do you have questions? What types of things can hurt turtles in the estuary? As you can see, the six pack ring takes 600 years to dissolve and the turtles will get caught in the six pack ring and they'll drown and they won't be able to eat. Turtles are reptiles, they need air to breathe. Another thing is these plastic bags, which kind of look like jellyfish to the turtles, and they'll sometimes try and eat this and it'll get caught in their stomach and they'll die that way. Another thing is this bottle that I found right outside in this water right out here. 
another bad thing for the turtles in this balloon. If if this when the air comes out of this balloon, it'll look kind of like a, a colorful jellyfish that the turtles will want to eat. Any more questions? What can we do as kids to help? You can tell your parents not to cut through the mark the channel markers in the bays because then they might hit a turtle that could the propeller could crush their um, their shell. Another way is if you're going to a car wash, make sure that car wash has special drainage so the tur so the water doesn't go into the bay into the estuaries and pollute the estuaries. Any more questions? Yeah. What is the most dangerous animal to turtles? That is the man, and that's why we need the help and not pollute our bays. Thank you. Well, Sandra, how did you get so wise? <laughs> well, everybody at Moat Marine has been helping me, um, and Jarrah's foot is holding my grant right now, and I just recently got a computer so I can put PowerPoint for the when I go to school to talk to kids. That, that is one of the things that Xander does. He's a 12-year-old uh, student, like I said, at the school in the park in Sarasota, and he spends several hours, and as well as the mother, spend several hours a week talking with, with students in our southwest Florida area. Well, we're going to see another creature that lives in estuaries in Florida, and it can be found in a few other estuaries outside of Florida. Here we have Monica Dorkin with the Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center, aka a press reporter, and she'll be telling us a little bit more about manatees. Thank you, Moran. We're here today for an exclusive interview with a Florida manatee. Once thought to be the mermaid of the sea by ancient mariners, this lovely marine mammal has agreed to answer any and all questions about her species and how they have adapted to living in the water. Please have your question ready when you are called upon and speak clearly into the microphone. First, the reporter from the Cyrenia Standard. Miss Tritkakos, if I may call you that, I have a question that most ladies do not like to answer. How much do you weigh? <laughs> of course you can call me that. And I am proud of my 1,000 pound girth. We manatees can weigh up to 3,500 pounds. You see, dear, we have very heavy bones which enable us to submerge, stay down in the water, to eat those yummy water plants. I have a layer of blubber and fat around my muscles and inner organs to help keep me warm in chilly rivers. Next question, please. Miss Manatee, your eyes look strange. Why? I have an eye on each side of my head so that I can view either side when I am swimming. I prefer to call them amazing. I also have inner membranes in my eyes that act like built-in swim goggles. I can make them cover my eyeballs for protection, but I can still see underwater. Isn't that amazing adaptation? Those science people call it a nictitating membrane. Next question, please. <laughs> Ma'am, is, is your nose amazing too? But of course. My nostrils can breathe at the surface of the water without any of the rest of my body showing at all. This nose comes equipped with a set of valves or doors, if you like, that I can close when I go under to keep out the water. Next reporter, please. So since you breathe air just like us, do you have lungs? You must have lungs. Yes, ducky. But my lungs run the whole length of my body. It's like having water wings inside that help me float straight when they are full of air. I also have lots of muscles in my lungs so that I can push a great deal of air out fast and pull more back in fast. Sometimes I have to take a quick breath and then go right back to eating or get out of the way of a boat going too fast, if I can. Next reporter, please. Pardon me, ma'am, but you look all gray and wrinkled. Why? <laughs> yes, aren't I lovely? This beautiful shade of brownish gray helps me blend in with my environment. You know, camouflage. I'm a big lady and it isn't easy to hide all this loveliness. But in murky water, I'm actually hard to find. Now, as to my wrinkles. They help me slough off skin that has algae or barnacles growing on it. I can hardly go to the mall for a facial. Next reporter. <laughs> We know that you cannot go to the mall, but how do you move around in your world? 
quite well, thank you. I have these front flippers for steering and paddling. They can also put a great deal of food into my hungry mouth. This beautiful rounded tail of mine pumps up and down to help propel me through the water. Yes, Mr. Reporter? I see that you have fingernails on your, those slippers of yours. How observant of you. Look at the little blue heron that came to watch us today. I have fingernails, just like my elephant cousin. We have fingernails. I can get a hold of my wet, slippery, grassy meal because of my lovely fingernails. Next question, please. I don't see any ears. How are you hearing us? Good question. I actually do have tiny ear openings behind my eyes, but I hear best when sound waves enter my fat-filled lower jaw and are felt by my ear bones nearby. Next reporter, please. What do you sound like underwater? Sometimes I groan when I stretch. We chirp, whistle, and squeak to each other when we want to communicate. Next. Ms. Kekas, how can you stay underwater for so long? That's another amazing adaptation or trait that we have developed over time. Our normal heart rate is 50 to 60 beats a minute. But when we want to stay under for, let's say an eight minute dive, I can slow my heart down to only 30 beats a minute. And if I want to take a little 20 minute nap, I can slow my heart rate all the way down to only eight beats a minute. Next question, please. <laughs> How many of your mermaids and mermen of the sea are left in our waters? Over 3,000 of us were counted in Florida waters from an aerial survey. They don't always spot all of us, of course, when they fly over the water. Sadly, we are an endangered species, but you can all help us to survive. Watch us, but don't bother or chase us. Don't throw fish line or litter into the water for us to accidentally swallow. It could tie up our insides and we could die. Be careful when boating with your families to go slow in shallow areas where we like to feed. Work hard with all the families in your community and schools to not pollute the water. Dirty rivers and bays leave less and less clean places for us to live. Thank you for your concern and cooperation. I must go now. We are really quite shy by nature and this whole interview thing is rather scary. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Well, thank you all. Thank and I'd like to show you again our students from Lee Middle School in Fort Myers, Florida. You all did a wonderful job. Thank you. So is it just turtles and manatees that live in our estuaries that are, that are bigger? Well, we have Dr. Doug Nowacek from Moat Marine Laboratory who will tell us more about some other creatures. And I'll need to go to this side of the table. <laughs> oh, that's right, Marin. Hi everybody, so I, I came to talk to you today a little bit about some of the bigger creatures that are, that are in the estuary and, and, and in fact some of the biggest. So you've heard a little bit about turtles, you've heard a little bit about manatees, but I'd like to show you the, all the marine mammals that live continuously in the water. And uh, I think pretty soon we'll have a graphic up on the page that will, will show us uh, the four types of marine mammals that live continuously in the ocean. And if we see that, if we see that graphic at the top we have a, a bottlenose dolphin and we see some of the features there, the blowhole, dorsal fin, uh, and the next two down are, are the big whales, and they look like they're the same size on that page, but they're actually, uh, they're actually quite different size. They're, they're much, much bigger. And then at the bottom we have the manatee. Now remember, these aren't the only marine mammals. Can anybody here tell me what are the, some of the other marine mammals in the world? What do we think? Shout it out. <laughs> Come on, you know. Porpoise. What's that? Porpoise. Porpoise, that's right. It's a kind of dolphin pretty close to a dolphin. What else? Uh, a seal. How about a seal? All right. Seals and sea lions are another good one. Uh, when I put that picture up, they don't live. Seals and sea lions and get, guess what else? Sea otters. Anybody think of sea otters? And polar bears are even marine mammals. So the picture that I put up are just the animals that live in the water continuously. So we're, maybe now we're looking at a picture of a bottlenose dolphin, so an underwater picture of a bottlenose dolphin, and that's the, one of the creatures I want to spend a little time on today because that's the animal that spends uh, a lot of its time in, in the Charlotte Harbor estuary. And you can see that we had that picture up before. You see those, those uh, 
pectoral flippers help them swim. They're very agile. That big tail helps them swim very fast. The, uh, uh, and that dorsal fin stabilizes them as they swim. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about bottlenose dolphins because they're the ones that are swimming right out here in the estuary. It's sometimes not so easy to see them. You can only see them really when they come to the surface here if you're in a boat. But three things about bottlenose dolphins. One is that they live in, in very interesting societies. They spend a lot of time with their mothers when they're young. They can spend up to three, between three and six years with their, with their mothers. Um, and as they grow up, the females oftentimes will spend a lot of time with their mothers when they're raising their own, uh, when they're raising their own calves. And the other really neat thing is that the males, uh, when they get older, they actually pair up with another male and those buddies, they stick together almost their entire lives. Part of it could be for uh, avoiding predation from sharks, uh, but they also might buddy up so they can get better access to females and they can uh, fight other males for, um, for access to females. Second thing is they make really, really neat, neat sounds. They make sounds that are like whistles, so they <whistles> you, If you put a hydrophone in the water, which is one of the things I work with a lot, uh, you can hear whistles a lot of the time from, from dolphins swimming around. And in fact, those whistles that they make, if you notice I made the same whistle over and over again, Bottlenose dolphins have what we call a signature whistle. And those whistles, they develop when they're young and they keep that whistle uh, almost throughout their entire lives. So it's a way of maintaining contact between dolphins. They make that whistle and somebody else will make their, their same whistle, so they, that way they keep in contact. But it's sort of funny to think, we don't go around saying our name all the time, right? You don't go around saying, I'm Bob, I'm Bob, I'm Bob. But use that, somebody else uses your name to call you to get your attention. So that's, that's another, uh, another way they use those whistles. So another sound. They echolocate. Does anybody else, does anybody here know uh, what other echolocating mammal there is? What animal uses sonar? What is it? The manatee. Uh, actually, the manatee doesn't. They make some cool sounds, but they, they don't make sonar sounds. I'm thinking of one that's not in the water, actually. Yeah. A bat. A bat. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. There are lots of species of bats that fly around, and, they, and a lot of them live around the estuary. And they use little sonar pulses that they send out sound, and it bounces off something and comes back. And that's the way they find their um, insect prey. Well, dolphins do the same thing. They're swimming around out there, and they're making these click sounds. They're very high frequency. We can't hear them unless we have some help from equipment. But they, those sounds bounce off fish, and they come back, and they use those sounds to find their fish. Speaking of fish, I, I borrowed this from Corbett. And does anybody want to have a mullet like a dolphin eats a mullet? Straight down the hatch, head first, not smoked either, but raw. Want to try? <laughs> <laughs> this one's pretty tasty because it's uh, because it's smoked. Ooh. Oh, look at that! All right, we got a regular <laughs> dolphin here. Anybody else? If you do, you gotta eat, eat it the way a dolphin does, straight down the hatch. So when the uh, when we talk about all these things that are going on going on out here in the estuary, from seagrasses to some of the invertebrates that Corbett talked about, um, clams and things, those are all very very important to to dolphins as well. So dolphins are. are sometimes the easiest thing to remember and think about when you see when you go out in the estuary and you see them out there or manatees or some of the bigger creatures turtles but they are very dependent on uh, like dr. John talked about with the seagrasses so those all all those things add into and are very important to the estuary we got a question uh, like um, I yesterday, um, yesterday in class we were learning about dolphins and um, I learned that they make this kind of clutching sound uh -huh. and, like when they're like arguing something when they're like in mating season or something like that? Well, they do make a lot of sounds during mating season. They use a lot of those whistles, in fact. They make a lot of sounds. They make sounds that sound like donkey, donkey brays. They sound, make sounds that people call rusty hinges, like doors swinging shut and closed. So let me just get to, some other, to, to the other species that I want to talk a little bit about today. And it's not my specialty, but sharks are the other big creature that lives out in the estuary. And there's a lot of really interesting research at Moat Marine Lab uh, on, shark on, on sharks, various things. They do population censuses to find out what sorts of sharks are out there. Um, some really interesting things just down in Lower Pine Island Sound. They're putting little uh, tags in sharks and they, they track them around so they know where they're going all the time. But sharks, people hear about uh, sharks being important in biomedicine and uh, cancer research. Um, that, all, that research is also going on out, up at Moat Marine Lab. And sharks aren't really that scary. A lot of the sharks out there are only about this big. So sharks are probably just as scared of you as you are of them. So don't, uh, uh, don't be too scared of sharks. They're really, really neat creatures. Do we have any time for questions, Marin? Yes, we do. We do. OK. Do we have a question? Okay. Actually, she... Go ahead. Oh. Uh, is there any way that um, sharks communicate with each other? We don't know very much about shark communication, and I certainly don't. Um, we don't know that they make very many sounds. Sharks have very good uh, 
perception of, of, of chemicals like smells and tastes, and they also have a really interesting electrical sense where they, um, they can sense electrical fields. Another question. What's, a, what's the difference between a dolphin and a porpoise? That's an excellent question. Um, people often put them, both dolphins and porpoises together, and they're pretty closely related. They're a lot closer than, than a manatee is to a dolphin. But porpoises are generally smaller, and they have different shaped teeth, and they have those sort of rounded snout noses instead of those long noses like bottlenose dolphins have. One more? Do dolphins and sharks get along? Do dolphins and sharks get along? Well, for the most part, yeah, probably. But they're, one thing to think about is that they don't just necessarily go after one another they are competitors, they go after the same food. So they're not just eating at each other, or com but they're actually competing for those same resources. Can anybody tell me, are there any other marine mammals in Charlotte Harbor, does anybody know? What do you think? Shout it out. Uh, mullet? Mullet, is mullet a fish or is mullet an animal, a mammal? A fish? It's a fish, there you go. And, and dolphins aren't fish, are they? They're mammals. Whales, seals, sea lions, do you think, out in Charlotte Harbor? Maybe. Maybe. Actually, pretty interesting. There are a lot of whales out in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, in the near shore waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Humpback whales, sperm whales out in the Gulf of Mexico. So they don't come into the estuary, but we do. They are close by. Well, thank you, Doug. You're welcome. Let's, let's look at the estuary a little bit here. We're at high tide now, but if we were at low tide, this area would be covered with feeding birds like herons and egrets. And for our last speaker today, we have John Sibley from Kokoloka Chapter of the Florida, Natu Florida Native Plant Society and owner of All Native Garden Center. Thank you, John. <laughs> and he'll tell us a little bit about what we could do as people to help protect the estuaries. Welcome, everyone, to sunny southwest Florida. Uh, we're here today. I. Uh, came to Southwest Florida myself 20 years ago from Connecticut because I got tired of shoveling snow. I really loved the environment. I soon learned that there is a detrimental impact from human population here, uh, particularly with the uh, installation of what we call unsustainable landscapes. And if we can look right here is a perfect case in point. This is Floritam grass, which requires a great deal of water to keep it healthy. If we were to incorporate native plants, they are drought tolerant and thrive on the conditions that have existed here for thousands of years. Florida, as you probably are aware, is means land of flowers. When the Spanish came and discovered it, they found thousands of species of flowers and they documented them, recorded them, and of course then immediately began to destroy them. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, well fortunately we've begun to return, reverse that trend. We've become environmentally conscious. When I was a young person we would read of whole rivers bursting into flames and we'd say, uh, duh, something must be wrong here. We began to look into our environment and we began to uh, become a part of our environment, research it and see what we were doing wrong that was uh, impacting the environment. And we found that if we did just a few things in our own very backyard, we've learned that these estuaries here are directly impacted from what we do as people. So we've... Well, John, we've got, we just had a pelican landing for, uh, to get, get, get their dinner. Great to see the pelican is going to get a healthy fish thanks to all of the people that have uh, taken their cause taken up their cause. I'd like to show you a few of the flowers here. This is what we is called firebush. This is the preferred nectar plant of the zebra longwing butterfly, which is the Florida state butterfly. It has a beautiful, graceful flight pattern, and it looks like a zebra because it has yellow stripes on black wings. This is also a nice nectar plant for hummingbirds. 
we have a lot of people that have come down from up north and say, well, I don't have any hummingbirds. Well, you're not going to have hummingbirds if you have Floritan grass. You need to have firebush. We also have a beautiful uh, plant here. This is called um, fiddlewood. has beautiful, nice aromatic blossoms on it which turn to berries eventually. A preferred plant source, a food source for several species of birds. The buntings, blue jays, thrushes all thrive on these plants, uh, berries. This is uh, Hemelium patens. It has several uh, common uh, 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 doublets, beach sunflower or dune daisy. This makes an excellent ground cover. It will cover up to three square feet of uh, eliminating grass. We also have mimosa here, which is called sensitive grass. I'm going to touch this and hopefully you'll be able to see. It's called sensitive grass because when it's touched, the leaves naturally curl up to pr protect themselves from predators. and impact from uh, foot traffic. There's several other species of plants that I didn't bring here that also could be incorporated in landscapes regardless of where you live in the United States. Uh, I would encourage you after this program to visit the website of the National Wildlife Federation and learn about the Backyard Habitat Program so that you can do something yourself. You can take a little initiative, you can turn off the TV, you can turn off the computer and take a few minutes to observe nature and be, be a part of nature by introducing a few plants that will attract uh, wildlife, whether it's butterflies, even, even rodents, snakes, uh, birds, and eventually you will help the long-range cause of keeping the estuaries clean and safe and healthy for all of us. Well, John, I think we have a few questions here. <laughs> this is Sue Scott with the City of Cape Coral. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm also a good friend of John's and a recent member of the uh, Cocoloba chapter, the Native Plant Society, and I encourage anyone to get involved with the Native Plant Society wherever you are. Uh, the native plants are part of your natural history. And that's usually not taught in the school, so you kind of need to get out there and do it on your own. But I, I want to go back to why we're doing native plants, John. Uh, isn't it true that the residential homeowner produces more pollution that ends up in our estuary than, say, agriculture or even um, uh, the ranchers or even business? Aren't they the... Yes, absolutely. We, this is what I referred to earlier, is people are inclined to want to have what appears to be a pretty landscape when it's not really pretty to everybody and especially the wildlife. So if we incorporate native plants, they're indigenous, they've lived here for thousands of years, they've learned to tolerate the climatic conditions, the soil conditions, and they ultimately give back. They're a food source for migrating birds that come down to the, uh, the uh, peninsula of Florida for thousands of years. Migrating birds have come down from the northern parts of the United States and Canada down the peninsula of Florida. We've destroyed a lot of that habitat. They need to rest and have and re-nourish themselves as they travel on to the Caribbean or even the southern portions of the state in the uh, the uh, Everglades. So Sue, what Sue mentioned was if we utilize some of these native plants and eliminate the non-native high maintenance landscaping, what will, it's a win-win situation for everybody, especially the animals and marine life in the estuaries. Well, thank you, John. Well, now we're going to go back to Monica Dorkin with the Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center, and she'll tell us a little bit about the birds in this area. Monica, would you join us, please? Hi. Hi, how are you? So could you tell us a little bit about the birds in this area? Sure. Um, I'm holding my friend, the bald eagle. 
the bald eagle is a very opportunistic bird and he just loves the estuary because there's plenty of fish for him in the estuary. These children behind me have been thinking about all the birds that they see in the estuary and they've got some suggestions. You guys want to call out some birds that you see in the estuary? Snail kite. Ivis. Osprey. The others? Seagull. Pelican. <laughs> what about the pink bird? Yeah. Spoonbill. That's it. Spoonbill. Yeah. <laughs> And they all have their different feeding styles, and that's what's so cool about the estuary, because the estuary accommodates all their different feeding styles. Some of them like to walk along and feed in the waters, and the spoonbill likes to take its spoonbill and just kind of feel for the, for the live prey. That spoonbill has so much sensors on it that it just instantly senses that there's a little critter under the water and snaps it right up. We've got um, ibis and egrets and herons in this estuary. We've got those little sandpipers and plovers that run along the beaches and catch those little clams. There's just an amazing array of birds that use the estuary. My favorite here is the bald eagle, of course. Um, we have one that just recently nested at Czech, and that pair of immature eagles, not quite grown up yet. They've done their nesting, and they, they're ready to become parents, but they did a little false nesting last spring. And they're flying around it in the daytime, and they're doing their little courtship dance up in the sky. And, they're real close to mangroves because they know that mangroves is where the fish are. Yes? <laughs> well, thank you, Monica. We have uh, several people that you've met today during, on camera uh, that I'd like to thank to, for their, their participation, but there's a lot of people that we haven't seen today. And that includes Moat Marine Laboratory, the laboratory itself, generous in donating the space and also the mobile exhibit, and also they're helping us, helping the, to pay for our refreshments. I'd like to thank specifically Ernie Estevez, Paula Clark, and Glenn Marcus. We've got Susan Scott with the City of Cape Coral and Bobby Rogers of Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center, Chris Smith of Cargill Fertilizer, Ernie Helms of U.S. Agrochemicals Corporation, the Friends of Charlotte Harbor NEP, the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council and Deanne Robeson and Ken Hetherington, and of course all of those, all of you who made Estuaries Live happen. And now we're going to go back to Corbett Torrance who will tell us a little bit more about the early Americans. Good morning. Uh, as we know, the Calusa were actually the most powerful tribe in southwest Florida, and fundamental to the Calusa was the estuaries, where they got their food, their tool shell, and also materials for building their, their mounds and stuff. Uh, these guys from Hardy County, Summer Marine Science Camp, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're just asking a question. They said, when we look in here and we see all these bones, they were asking, how can you tell which are which? Well, the first thing you want to look at is, is it a fish bone, is it a mammal bone, or is it a reptile? And fish bones have two cones. There's a cone on one side and a cone on the other. So what do we say? Cone, cone, cone fish bone. <laughs> Mammals are flat on both sides. This is a deer vertebrae. Uh, the Calusa, about 90% of their meat were fish from, and shellfish from the estuary. But they also ate, uh, actually more like 95%, but they also did eat deer and uh, raccoon, uh, snakes and turtles and other animals as well, some birds. Uh, so here we have a deer vertebrae, it's flat on both sides. And if it was a reptile, it'd have a bubble on one side and a cone on the other. Any other questions you guys had or wanted to ask about this stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, why do, um, like, they have the, um, the reptiles, do they, why do they have a cone on each side? Oh, well, the fish are the ones with the cone on the both sides. And, I, you know, I can't tell you exactly why that happened, how that developed in that way. But as an archaeologist, we use that to sort out whether these things are fish bones or whether they're mammal bones or whether reptile bones. But I, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. Uh, these guys, all these guys, we call these gastropods. I think you heard that word earlier. And the gastropods include such things as the tulip and the fighting cock, the pear whelk, the lightning whelk, and the king's crown. And then we also have what we call bivalves, clam, animals that have two bi, two valves, two sides. And here we would have, we, this is a scallop, but we also have the quahog clam, and we have surf clams, and a variety of bivalves that the Calusa also ate. And inside here, we actually have the little tiny vertebrae to the thread herring, and we've all been kind of eating like a Calusa here today. So we've been eating a little bit of thread. You guys like these, right? Yeah. Yeah? And then also we've been eating the, the mullet, which you've seen uh, dropping in the background today. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, you know, how, say if it's a different, two different reptiles, uh, say how the people, they, they found um, like dinosaurs, dinosaur bones, and 
um, reptiles from the day. Like, how could you um like compare par, compare to, compare them together? That's a good question. In fact, actually, there's archaeologists, and archaeologists study what people do, and there's paleontologists, and they study what dinosaurs do. And actually, dinosaurs lived millions of years before people. So archaeologists don't look at dinosaur bones. Paleontologists do. So that's something, actually, we don't really know about. Archaeologists here in southwest Florida, we study the Calusa, and uh, the Calusa were the original people here before the Europeans got here. I have a question. Um, you know how they have the bigger shells like this, mm -hmm. and they say you can hear the ocean in them. Why is that? You actually don't hear the ocean. What you're hearing is your blood flowing into your ear and out of your ear. <laughs> and that's actually what you're hearing. You're, you're creating like a little speaker over your ear, and so what you're hearing is the blood moving in and out of your ear. So it sounds like the waves rolling, but it's really blood rolling into your ear. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank you all for joining us on Estuaries Live in Charlotte Harbor. And we're going to leave you this hour showing you our estuary again. And I want to remind you that if you have any questions, please send, this, send them to us by email. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.